If you fill a balloon with helium, a substance lighter than the nitrogen, oxygen, and other elements which compose the air around it, the balloon will immediately fly upwards. If you fill a balloon with hydrogen, a substance even lighter than helium, the balloon will fly upwards even faster. If you blow a dandelion seed out of your hands, a substance just barely heavier than the air, it will float away and slowly but eventually fall to the ground. And if you drop an anvil from your hands, something much heavier than the air, it will quickly and directly fall straight to the ground. Now this has absolutely nothing to do with gravity. The fact that light things rise up and heavy things fall down is simply a natural property of weight and density. That is very different from gravity. Gravity is a hypothetical magnetic-like force possessed by large masses which Isaac Newton needed to help explain the heliocentric theory of the universe. Lady Blunt says, Most people in England have either read or heard that Sir Isaac Newton's theory of gravitation was originated by his seeing an apple fall to the earth from a tree in his garden. Persons gifted with ordinary common sense would say that the apple fell down to earth because, bulk for bulk, it was heavier than the surrounding air. But if, instead of the apple, a fluffy feather had been detached from the tree, a breeze would probably have sent the feather floating away and the feather would not reach the earth until the surrounding air became so still that, by virtue of its own density, the feather would fall to the ground. Wilbur Voliva, a famous flat earther in the early 20th century, gave lectures all over America against Newtonian astronomy. He would begin by walking on stage with a book, a balloon, a feather, and a brick, and ask the audience, how is it that a law of gravitation can pull up a toy balloon and cannot put up a brick? I throw up this book, why doesn't it go on up? That book went up as far as the force behind it forced it, and it fell because it was heavier than the air, and that is the only reason. I cut the string of a toy balloon. It rises, gets to a certain height, and then it begins to settle. I take this brick and a feather. I blow the feather. Yonder it goes. Finally, it begins to settle and comes down. This brick goes up as far as the force forces it, and then it comes down because it is heavier than the air. That is all. David Wardlaw Scott says, Any object which is heavier than the air, and which is unsupported, has a natural tendency to fall by its own weight. Newton's famous apple at Woolsthorpe, or any other apple when ripe, loses hold of its stalk, and being heavier than the air, drops as a matter of necessity to the ground, totally irrespective of any attraction of the earth. For if such attraction existed, why does not the earth attract the rising smoke, which is not nearly so heavy as the apple? The answer is simple, because the smoke is lighter than the air, and therefore does not fall but ascends. Gravitation is only a subterfuge employed by Newton in his attempt to prove that the earth revolves around the sun, and the quicker it is relegated to the tomb of all the Capulets, the better will it be for all classes of society. Thomas Winship says, the law of gravitation is said by the advocates of the Newtonian system of astronomy to be the greatest discovery of science and the foundation of the whole of modern astronomy. If, therefore, it can be shown that gravitation is a pure assumption and an imagination of the mind only, that it has no existence outside of the brains of its expounders and advocates, the whole of the hypothesis of this modern so-called science fall to the ground as flat as the surface of the ocean, and this most exact of all sciences, this wonderful feat of the intellect, becomes at once the most ridiculous superstition and the most gigantic imposture to which ignorance and credulity could ever be exposed. Einstein's theory of relativity and the entire heliocentric model of the universe hinge upon Newton's law of gravitation. Heliocentrists claim that the sun is the most massive object in the heavens, more massive even than the earth, and therefore the earth and other planets, by law, are caught up in the sun's gravity and forced to orbit perpetual circles and ellipses around it. They claim that gravity also somehow allows people, buildings, the oceans, and all of nature to exist on the underside of their ball earth without falling off. Now, even if gravity did exist, why would it cause both planets to orbit the sun and people to stick to the earth? Gravity should either cause people to float in suspended circular orbits around the earth, or it should cause the earth to be pulled and crashed into the sun. What sort of magic is gravity that it can glue people's feet to the ball earth while causing earth itself to revolve ellipses around the sun? The two effects are very different, yet the same cause is attributed to both. Furthermore, 
this magnetic-like attraction of massive objects gravity is purported to have can be found nowhere in the natural world. There is no example in nature of a massive sphere or any other shaped object which, by virtue of its mass alone, causes smaller objects to stick to or orbit around it. There is nothing on Earth massive enough that it can be shown to cause even a dust bunny to stick to or orbit around it. Try spinning a wet tennis ball or any other spherical object with smaller things placed on its surface, and you will find that everything falls or flies off and nothing sticks to or orbits around it. To claim the existence of a physical law without a single practical evidential example is hearsay, not science. Lady Blunt and Albert Smith wrote, That bodies in some instances are seen to approach each other is a fact, but that their mutual approach is due to an attraction or pulling process on the part of these bodies is, after all, a mere theory. Hypotheses may sometimes be admissible, but when they are invented to support other hypotheses, they are not only to be doubted, but discredited and discarded. The hypothesis of a universal force called gravitation is based upon, and was indeed invented with a view to support another hypothesis, namely that the Earth and sea together make up a vast globe whirling away through space, and therefore needing some force or forces to guide it in its mad career, and so control it as to make it conform to what is called its annual orbit around the sun. The theory, first of all, makes the Earth to be a globe, then not a perfect globe, but an oblate spheroid, flattened at the poles, then more oblate, until it was in danger of becoming so flattened that it would be like a cheese, and passing over minor variations of form, we are finally told that the earth is pear-shaped, and that the ellipsoid has been replaced by an apoid. What shape it may assume next, we cannot tell. It will depend upon the whim or fancy of some astute and speculating scientist. How is it that gravity is so strong that it can hold all the oceans, buildings, and people stuck to the underside of the ball earth, but so weak that it allows birds, bugs, smoke, and balloons to casually evade its grips completely? How is it that gravity holds our bodies clung to the underside of a ball earth, but yet we can easily raise our legs and arms, walk or jump, and feel no such constant downward pulling force? How is it that gravity can cause planets to revolve elliptical orbits around a single center of attraction? Ellipses by nature require two foci, and the force of gravitation would have to regularly increase and decrease to keep planets in constant orbit and prevent pulling them into direct collision courses. Thomas Winship says, that the sun's path is an exact circle for only about four periods in a year, and then of only a few hours at the equinoxes and solstices, completely disproves the might-have-been of circular gravitation, and by consequence, all of gravitation. If the sun were of sufficient power to retain the earth in its orbit when nearest the sun, when the earth arrived at that part of its elliptical path farthest from the sun, the attractive force, unless very greatly increased, would be utterly incapable of preventing the earth rushing away into space in a right line forever, as astronomers say. On the other hand, it is equally clear that if the sun's attraction were just sufficient to keep the earth in its proper path when farthest from the sun, and thus to prevent it rushing off into space, the same power of attraction when the earth was nearest the sun would be so much greater that, unless the attraction were very greatly diminished, nothing would prevent the earth rushing towards and being absorbed by the sun, there being no counterbalancing focus to prevent such a catastrophe. As astronomy makes no reference to the increase and diminution of the attractive force of the sun, called gravitation, for the above necessary purposes, we are again forced to the conclusion that the great discovery of which astronomers are so proud is absolutely non-existent. And N. Crossland says, We are asked by the Newtonian to believe that the action of gravitation, which we can easily overcome by the slightest exercise of volition in raising a hand or foot, is so overwhelmingly violent when we lose our balance and fall a distance of a few feet, that this force, which is imperceptible under usual conditions, may, under extraordinary circumstances, cause the fracture of every limb we possess? Common sense must reject this interpretation. Gravitation does not furnish a satisfactory explanation of the phenomena here described, whereas the definition of weight already given does. 
for a body seeking in the readiest manner its level of stability would produce precisely the result experienced. If the influence which kept us securely attached to this earth were identical with that which is powerful enough to disturb a distant planet in its orbit, we should be more immediately conscious of its masterful presence and potency, whereas this influence is so impotent in the very spot where it is supposed to be most dominant that we find an insurmountable difficulty in accepting the idea of its existence. Heliocentrists claim the ball earth is perpetually spinning on its axis at a mind-numbing 1,038 miles per hour, or 19 miles per second, and somehow, people, animals, buildings, oceans, and other surface phenomena can stick to the underside of the spinning ball without falling or flying off. Take a ride on the Gravitron at your local amusement park, however, and notice how the faster it spins, the more you are pushed away from the center of spin, not towards it. Even if the centripetal, inward-pulling force, of gravity did exist, which it does not, the centrifugal, outward-pushing force, of the ball Earth's supposed 19 mile per second spin would also exist and have to be overcome, yet neither of these opposing forces have ever been shown to have any existence outside the imaginations of heliocentric scientists. David Wardlaw Scott says, we are not like flies which, by the peculiar formation of their feet, can crawl on a ball, but we are human beings who require a plain surface on which to walk, and how could we be fastened to the earth whirling, according to your theory, around the sun, at the rate of nineteen miles per second? The famed law of gravitation will not avail, though we are told that we have fifteen pounds of atmosphere pressing on every square inch of our bodies, but this does not appear to be particularly logical, for there are many athletes who can leap nearly their own height and run a mile in less than five minutes, which they could not possibly do if they were thus handicapped. And Crossland says, The attraction of gravitation is said to be stronger at the surface of the earth than at a distance from it. Is it so? If I spring upwards perpendicularly, I cannot with all my might ascend more than four feet from the ground. But if I jump in a curve with a low trajectory, keeping my highest elevation about three feet, I might clear a bound of space above the earth of about eighteen feet, so that practically I can overcome the so-called force pull at the distance of four feet in the proportion of eighteen to four, being the very reverse of what I ought to be able to do according to the Newtonian hypothesis. Newton also theorized, and it is now commonly taught, that the Earth's ocean tides are caused by gravitational lunar attraction. If the moon is only 2,160 miles in diameter, and the Earth 8,000 miles, however, using their own math and law, it follows that the Earth is 87 times more massive, and therefore the larger body should attract the smaller to it, and not the other way around. If the Earth's greater gravity is what keeps the moon in orbit, it is impossible for the moon's lesser gravity to supersede the Earth's gravity at Earth's sea level, where its gravitational attraction would even further outtrump the moon's, not to mention the velocity and path of the moon are uniform, and should therefore exert a uniform influence on the Earth's tides, when in actuality the Earth's tides vary greatly. Furthermore, if ocean tides are caused by moon's gravitation, how is it that lakes, ponds, and other smaller bodies of standing water remain outside the moon's grasp, while the gigantic oceans are so affected? Thomas Winship says, If the moon lifted up the water, it is evident that near the land the water would be drawn away and low instead of high tide caused. Again, the velocity and path of the moon are uniform, and it follows that if she exerted any influence on the earth, that influence could only be a uniform influence. But the tides are not uniform. At Port Natal, the rise and fall is about six feet, while at Bira, about 600 miles up the coast, the rise and fall is 26 feet. This effectually settles the matter that the moon has no influence on the tides. Tides are caused by the gentle and gradual rise and fall of the earth on the bosom of the mighty deep. In inland lakes, there are no tides, which also proves that the moon cannot attract either the earth or water to cause tides, but the fact that the basin of the lake is on the earth which rests on the waters of the deep shows that no tides are possible as the waters of the lakes together with the earth rise and fall and thus the tides at the coast are caused while there are no tides on waters unconnected with the sea samuel robotham says it is affirmed that the intensity of attraction increases with proximity and vice versa 
How then, when the waters are drawn up by the moon from their bed and away from the earth's attraction, which at that greater distance from the center is considerably diminished, while that of the moon is proportionally increased, how is it possible that all the waters acted on should be prevented leaving the earth and flying away to the moon? If the moon has power of attraction sufficient to lift the waters of earth at all, even a single inch from their deepest receptacles, where the earth's attraction is much greater, there is nothing in the theory of attraction of gravitation to prevent her taking to herself all the waters which came within her influence. Let the smaller body once overcome the power of the larger, and the power of the smaller becomes greater than when it first operated, because the matter acted on is nearer to it. Proximity is greater, and therefore power is greater. How then can the waters of the ocean immediately underneath the moon flow towards the shores, and so cause a flood tide? Water flows, it is said, through the law of gravity or attraction of the earth's center. Is it possible then for the moon, having once overcome the power of the earth, to let go her hold upon the waters through the influence of a power which she has conquered, and which therefore is less than her own? The above and other difficulties which exist in connection with the explanation of the tides afforded by the Newtonian system have led many, including Sir Isaac Newton himself, to admit that such explanation is the least satisfactory portion of the theory of gravitation. Thus we have been carried forward by the sheer force of evidence to the conclusion that the tides of the sea do not arise from the attraction of the moon, but simply from the rising and falling of the floating earth in the waters of the great deep. That calmness which is found to exist at the bottom of the great seas could not possibly be if the waters were alternately raised by the moon and pulled down by the earth. David Wardlaw Scott says, Even Sir Isaac Newton himself confessed that the explanation of moon's action on the tides was the least satisfactory part of his theory. This theory asserts that the larger objects attract the smaller, and the mass of the moon being reckoned as only one-eighth of that of the earth, it follows that if, by the presumed force of gravitation, the earth revolves around the sun, much more, for the same reason, should the moon do so likewise, instead of which that willful orb still continues to go round our world. Tides vary greatly in height, owing chiefly to the different configurations of the adjoining lands. At Chepstow, it rises to sixty feet, at Portishead to fifty, while at Dublin Bay it is but twelve, and at Wexford only five feet. That the earth itself has a slight tremulous motion may be seen in the movement of the spirit level, even when fixed as steadily as possible, and that the sea has a fluctuation may be witnessed by the oscillation of an anchored ship in the calmest day of summer. By what means the tides are so regularly affected is at present only conjectured. Possibly it may be by atmospheric pressure on the waters of the great deep, and perhaps even the moon itself, as suggested by the late Dr. Robotham, may influence the atmosphere, increasing or diminishing its barometric pressure, and indirectly the rise and fall of earth in the waters. Samuel Robotham says, Bearing this fact in mind that there exists a continual pressure of the atmosphere upon the earth, and associating it with the fact that the earth is a vast plain stretched out upon the waters, and it will be seen that it must of necessity slightly fluctuate or slowly rise and fall in the water. As by the action of the atmosphere, the earth is slowly depressed, the water moves towards the receding shore and produces the flood tide, and when, by the reaction of the resisting ocean medium, the earth gradually ascends and the waters recede, and the ebb tide is produced. This is the general cause of tides. Whatever peculiarities are observed, they may be traced to the reaction of channels, bays, headlands, and other local causes. That the earth has a vibratory or tremulous motion, such as must necessarily belong to a floating and fluctuating structure, is abundantly proved by the experience of astronomers and surveyors. If a delicate spirit level be firmly placed upon a rock or upon the most solid foundation which it is possible to construct, the very curious phenomenon will be observed of constant change in the position of the air bubble. However, carefully the level may be adjusted and the instrument protected from the atmosphere, the bubble will not maintain its position many seconds together. A somewhat similar influence has been noticed in astronomical observatories, where instruments of the best construction and placed in the most approved positions cannot always be relied upon without occasional readjustment. In the past several decades, NASA has shown video of astronauts supposedly in low Earth orbit experiencing complete weightlessness or zero gravity. How is this weightless effect achieved if gravity doesn't exist? As it turns out, for the past several decades, 
NASA, together with Boeing, have been perfecting so-called zero-g planes and zero-g maneuvers, which are able to produce weightlessness at any altitude. Aboard modified Boeing 727s, specially trained pilots perform aerobatic maneuvers known as parabolas. Planes climb with a pitch angle of 45 degrees using engine thrust and elevator controls. Then, when maximum height is reached, the craft is pointed downward at high speed. The period of weightlessness begins while ascending and lasts all the way up and over the parabola until reaching a downward pitch angle of 30 degrees, at which point the maneuver is repeated. Therefore, all NASA's footage of astronauts aboard space shuttles or the International Space Station can be easily hoaxed and simulated in Earth atmosphere aboard a zero-g plane. In fact, Watching footage of zero-g plane flights alongside footage of NASA astronauts supposedly floating around their space shuttles and space stations, no observable difference can be seen between the two. Astronomers claim to have measured all the planet's distances, shapes, orbits, weights, relative positions, and times of revolution all based on the law of gravitation, and without gravity, their entire cosmology folds under its own weight. Without gravity, people cannot stand upside down on a ball Earth. Without gravity, the Earth and planets cannot be revolving around the Sun. Without Newtonian gravitation, Einsteinian relativity, Copernican heliocentricity, and the entire Big Bang ball Earth mythos cannot exist and falls to pieces. Gravity, both metaphorically and quite literally, just does not hold any water, not as a sound theory of cosmology, and not as a law supposedly responsible for holding in the world's oceans. William Carpenter says, Man's experience tells him that he is not constructed like the flies that can live and move upon the ceiling of a room with as much safety as on the floor, and since the modern theory of a planetary Earth necessitates a crowd of theories to keep company with it, and one of them is that men are really bound to the Earth by a force which fastens them to it like needles round a spherical lodestone, a theory perfectly outrageous and opposed to all human experience, it follows that unless we can trample upon common sense and ignore the teachings of experience, we have an evident proof that Earth is not a globe. If we could, after our minds had once been opened to the light of truth, conceive of a globular body on the surface of which human beings could exist, the power, no matter by what name it be called, that would hold them on would then necessarily have to be so constraining and cogent that they could not live. The waters of the oceans would have to be a solid mass, for motion would be impossible. But we not only exist, but live and move, and the water of the oceans skips and dances like a thing of life and beauty. This is a proof that the earth is not a globe. Gerard Hickson said, Nearly a hundred years ago, Kepler suggested that some kind of unknown force must hold the earth and the heavenly bodies in their places. And now Sir Isaac Newton, the greatest mathematician of his age, took up the idea and built the law of gravitation. The name is derived from the Latin word gravis, which means heavy, having weight, while the law of gravitation is defined as that mutual action between masses of matter by virtue of which every such mass tends toward every other with a force varying directly as the product of the masses and inversely as the square of their distances apart. Reduced to simplicity, gravitation is said to be that which attracts everything towards every other thing. That does not tell us much, and yet the little it does tell us is not true, for a thoughtful observer knows very well that everything is not attracted towards every other thing. The definition implies that it is a force, but it does not say so, for that phrase mutual action is ambiguous and not at all convincing. Gabrielle Henriette says, the system of gravitation which makes the sun the moving center of the universe, the awkward principles of which are anything but certain since they apply to invisible circumstances so that they cannot be checked, is here replaced by the old geocentric system universally accepted until the 17th century, in view, of course, of its undisputable obviousness, and in which the earth, in a state of immobility and surrounded by the planets visibly moving round it, including the sun, is at the center of our universe. These two facts, which explain almost everything, are firstly the positive existence above the earth of a solid dome constituting the sky, and secondly the non-material nature of the planets and constellations, which are not physical masses, but merely luminous manifestations without substance. These are the two circumstances which lead today to the fundamental transformation of astronomy. And Professor Bernstein, in his letters to the British Association, writes, the theory that motions are produced through material attraction is absurd. 
Attributing such a power to mere matter, which is passive by nature, is a supreme illusion. It is a lovely and easy theory to satisfy any man's mind, but when the practical test comes, it falls all to pieces and becomes one of the most ridiculous theories to common sense and judgment ever conceived.